This program is brought to you by Pussy Magnets. Put a man jogging friend with a pussy magnet. Oh, hey. Welcome, 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 my lovely lumps. Or should I say lovely labs? I don't know. They're both good. <laughs> I'm so thrilled to have you here in the Labia Lounge to yarn about all things sexuality, womanhood, holistic health, and everything in between. Your legs. <laughs> oh, oh, cringe. I couldn't help myself. Anyway, I am your host, Freya Graff, and I am a holistic sex coach and educator and yoni mapping therapist. So basically, I make my living massaging vaginas and teaching people about sex. Yeah, pretty cool. (laughs) So as you can imagine, we are going to have vag loads of real chats with real people about real shit. So buckle up, you're about to receive the sex ed that you never had and have a bloody good laugh while you're at it. Before we get stuck in, though, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm recording this podcast, the Manang people. It's an absolute privilege to be living and creating dope podcast content on Noongar country, and I pay respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. Now, if y'all are ready, let's flap and do this. (laughs) Oh, is there such thing as having too many vagina jokes in the one intro? Whatever. I'm leaving it in. It's my podcast. Don't panic, you're not broken. Your sex education was a piece of shit. Get your flaps out and pull up the couch. It's the Labia Lounge. Well, well, well. Hello, my lovely lumps. I'm fucking pumped because today I've got Miss K, a professional dominatrix uh, who has a live-in house bitch or house slave. And I've brought her into the labia lounge to ask the things that we all want to know about the BDSM lifestyle and doming. Um, And just a little heads up, we're using an alias instead of her name um, because, well, for obvious reasons, totally fair enough. And although Miss K has a pretty impressive um, list of accolades that I could reel off right now about her career, we're going to keep things pretty anonymous. So I won't be giving you any more info than that about this wonderful woman. So um, thank you so much for joining me, my dear. I'm really glad that you're comfortable and willing to come and talk about this stuff um, because everyone wants to know and wants to ask questions but doesn't know if they can or isn't sure where to ask them. Um, So I'm really excited to get stuck into it with you. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited. I'm excited to share. Fabulous. So first things first, how long have you been doming for and how, how did you get into it all? Well, I guess really it it depends. I mean, I've definitely um, been doing this on and off throughout my life. Um, I was giving golden showers as a teenager, basically. Um, (laughs) And so, you know, there's there's that. Um, But life took a whole different turn when I um, spontaneously um, moved to the United States, which was in August 2019. And I just came for Burning Man and a friend of mine from Perth was here and had... um, yeah, invited me to come and do some work with her as a pro dom. And it was something that I've always been fascinated about. And I knew that I would do it at some point. And so, you know, I just threw myself at it. And so I actually, there was a lot of weird things that happened that are very, um, just very lucky, I guess. Um, I met my slave uh, about a week or two after actually um, entering that world professionally and wow. um, he's been with me ever since and my partner two weeks before that so wow. yeah they <laughs> yeah so it's been a wild ride oh my gosh incredible it sounds quite synchronistic and as though you were kind of 
in the right place at the right time and everything was happening as it was meant to, because once you did kind of go, all right, let's, let's give the pro doming a go and let's, let's kind of really commit and dive in. Everything just fell into place for you and the ball was well and truly rolling. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And and that's one of the things that I love about, um, just life. Like I have always believed in asking for what you want. And, you know, sometimes you get, uh, you know, some creepers and as long as you are able to discern and navigate that, um, yeah, like I, I've always got what I wanted and what I've asked for. And and that Mm. was one of the things I actually, I found him, um, by posting, Publicly on on FetLife, uh, I asked for, well, I didn't ask. I I put an application up of like, this is what I want. And I wanted a cleaner for our dungeon space. And I was very specific about all the qualities that this person must have. And Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and he was the first guy that we actually interviewed. And yeah, never looked back. Wow. So this is you and your friend who's also doing pro doming. You had a dungeon space together and and you brought him into that. That was right. Yeah. Mm, cool. Yeah. Cause my next question was going to be like, how do you find clients? And um, you know, how do you what's the like interview process? What's sort of usually involved in like um, setting up an agreement, I suppose, with them and, and setting up that container to work together. That's in like a really safe, responsible way. Yeah. Um, so the, the places that you can typically advertise, there's a bunch of different, uh, platforms and there's, they're always popping up. Um, but the main platform that I used at the time then was Eros. And Mm -hmm. so, I, and and then, you know, there's also like, there's a bunch of online platforms where, you know, you can do videos and stuff like that. So that also can um, act as a bridge for that, uh, for that Mm -hmm. meeting. And, you know, of course, when COVID happened, then I moved entirely online. So Mm -hmm. that was a whole trip as well. Um, (laughs) But I would say that in terms of like the the interview process and actually like um, finding um, an alignment with a client. I always have just had a application form on my website. So all of the platforms that I've used, I've always like linked them up to my website. And then from there, there would be an application form and my full information. Right. And so yeah. that application is designed to give me all of the information that I want and need so that I can make an informed decision about whether this is a good match. And, you know, often, often it's not, and, you know, you have to get comfortable with like turning people down and, you know, it's the same um, as anything really. Like you, there's a saying in the Dom community that, you know, you can't be the McDom and it's, you know, we all know that you can't cast that net so wide that you Mm. catch everyone because then you end up being good at nothing so yeah Mm, yeah absolutely I feel like that applies to lots of different things um so how many (laughs) clients would you work with at at any given time like do you kind of cap it at at a certain number because it just gets too much or like and is this your full-time thing or yeah I mean it definitely um it, I, I kind of feel like there's two worlds because as I said, when I first started, I was doing real life sessions. And mm-hmm. then once the pandemic hit, I actually moved entirely online. So mm-hmm. it was, you know, just very, very different. And so when I was doing it in real life, I would probably see on a busy day, it would be three clients a day. Mm-hmm. Um, and that would go sometimes through the week. Um, wouldn't do weekends just for, you know, self-care and having that mm-hmm. time away. But Um, Yeah, I would um, always just ensure that I had enough time for, you know, obviously in between the cleanup and also like the negotiation and stuff was actually, um, that was done beforehand. So that wasn't a thing Mm -hmm. within the actual session. But the aftercare is something that you really need to consider. And so, 
Yeah, as long as you have adequate space and time for aftercare, then yeah, I think um, yeah, it's, it's down to the individual of how much they want to take on, really. Mm, yeah, cool. So, what what kind of things are actually before I ask that? Yeah, what what are some of the different kinds of roles that your clients like to play or identify with? You know, like for example, as a pet or house slave or doormat, or what are what are some of the yeah like dynamics that you have in in your agreements with clients? <laughs> um yeah there there are a bunch you know like there uh the common roles i guess um would be you know the, the slave which um mm-hmm. i want to just say that uh the the relationship that i have with my slave is quite different to most of what most people would encounter and i say that because you know although i met him very early on that was like just such magical fluke I have since worked in that world and and realized that most most people that operate in that world especially penis owners uh you know things change when you've got a heart on and Mm. when you're you know the the post conversion is is very different and so um yeah, slaves are are a common one, but it's all it's all seems to be very limited. So I just want to distinguish that the the relationship that I have with my slave is not just like a um a thing that happens for an hour on a Thursday night. You know, yeah. like this is like a live in twenty four mm-hmm. hour kind of thing. Um, yeah. That said, the common roles that you will mostly see are stuff like sissification. So you get your sissy boys. And you know your little playthings and house bitches or jesters and yeah, there's there's you know pain sluts and foot sluts and th- there's yeah there's there's quite a diverse field of um, of people wanting to be different things. Mm, yeah, yeah. And do you have like a particular repertoire? Like you kind of do the slave thing and maybe like one or two others that are your like favorite roles or dynamics? Or are you kind of just like, yep, I'll, I mean, you were saying earlier, you don't cast your net too wide. What are your like specific, yeah. kind, what are your specialties? <laughs> <laughs> um, I really enjoy playing in the field of taboo fetishes um Mm -hmm. so that can go in many different directions and I'll come back to that later in terms of like um you know it can be a a a big whole you know it's a can of worms essentially Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. you know when we're dealing with taboos as you will know like that comes stigma comes a lot of questioning comes the questioning rightfully so of ethics Mm -hmm. um but yeah, I would say that what I really enjoy apart from taboo is like like degradation, humiliation. I like public humiliation and I really enjoy slave training as well. They're, they're the main areas that I like to play in. Oh, so just for people who have like no idea, because a lot of this might be really brand new concepts um, and pretty foreign to people, what does, give us an example of like what public degradation might look like or what slave training might look like if you can sure um so it barely it it does vary a lot because it really depends on the specific fetish that a slave might have like that might be like hopefully it's going to be ser it's going to be service orientated and so it's uh and, and that's what my slave um is very focused on um, but also like impact play is a, a very common one too. And it's very interesting, um, because when you think about it, if someone wants to be a, a pain slut and receive the pain, essentially you're serving them. Mm. If you take a moment to just think about that, like, and so, yeah, so th- there's, there's a lot of, um, I'll I'll come back to this, but uh, 80% of BDSM is psychology. 
Mm. It's not just the physical tools and the act of like flogging, like you're playing with psychology ultimately. So yeah, I would say um, to round up that answer that, yeah, like service, service is, is definitely um, where my focus is at at least. Yeah. Cool. Amazing. Um, Sorry to just like slam you with question after question. I just have so many things I want to ask. Um, no, go for, a, you go for it. You go for it. Great. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so this might be leaping ahead, but I know everyone is dying to know. And when I put it out to my community, like, what do you want to ask a professional dom? Most people were like, okay, well, what are, what are like some, what are the most out there or like interesting or like kind of, uh, I don't know, the most, what are some of the things that you've done through this work uh, or some things that your clients want you to do or ask you to do, um, I suppose, that are particularly like sensational or interesting <laughs> to people? <laughs> yeah um I will say this that horny submissive men will ask for the most gross and hilarious stuff mm-hmm. and uh, the most interesting request that I think I've had is um I had a submissive that really wanted to eat my cat's turds <laughs> so that that was a thing um which mm. never happened. Um, but yeah, that, that gives you some kind of idea of, of how gross they can be. And mm. um, which I I identify in the realm of BDSM as a humiliatrix. And I, I love humiliation. Um, I find it very entertaining. And as long as it is all consensual and it's ethical and no one's, you know, getting hurt from that, then you know i i will um entertain many requests but yeah that that was one that like yeah it was a bit edgy um totally i as i said <laughs> yeah my cat did not consent and so <laughs> yeah I, I i would say that one of the other things that i guess for a lot of people is pretty out there but you know I've I've done many and I love doing them because I'm very good at it are uh, golden showers mm-hmm. um and as I said I've been doing that from a young age um I, I was doing that as a teenager and I have great aim and it just it happens very easily for me um also uh I really like spitting and I've got a great aim with that and I can spit like a llama so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's something that is um is definitely um yeah it, I've had a lot of requests for that and um yeah I'm very good at that. And aside from those things, one of the other things that I really do enjoy, of course, and um I think this is something that always gains a lot of interest is financial domination too. Are you going to elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah, sure. You you hit me with your questions. Um, and I I'm happy to um ramble on and I just, you know, I'm mindful not to go on a tangent because I know we have a lot to cover. Um sure. but yeah, financial domination um is the act or the the fetish. It's it's money kink essentially. And so it is the act of the submissive getting off on handing their money over to their dominatrix. And so, yeah, it is a very, um, I would say it's probably like one of the most taboo kinks out there um, because, yeah, like we, we hold money with such power, right? It, it, it has mm. such power over us. So, yeah, it's a fascinating kink and, and there's a lot to be said about it too. Mm, yeah, cool. I mean, that one's always appealed to me the most, but I, uh, I definitely didn't, didn't have enough of an understanding. I was like, so you can just give me a credit card and then I can just do my thing and see you later. Right. But, um, you know, often in these dynamics or relationships, there's actually a fair bit more expected back of you as the, the Dom, um, I did dabble at one point. I just was kind of like, yeah, I just want to make some quick money or I want to like kind of 
um, experiment a little bit in this world, but I, I, it's not really, it's not really something that I actually find um, erotic or enjoyable or I'm like, I'm, I'm so vanilla. I'm just going to admit it. I'm super vanilla. And I did try, I, <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I guess I'm pretty open-minded, but I'm still at the core pretty vanilla because when it came down to it, I was like doing these dom sessions and going through the motions, but like actually hating it and just feeling really sad. And, um, and yeah, like kind of wanted to get the benefits, which I saw as like free house cleaning and some money without actually having to be that engaged and invested. Um, and like you said, it is a service thing. So like when, you know, I brought in someone to be a house slave, I was kind of like wanting to just give them a list of chores. Here's the cleaning stuff, do your thing. I'm going to sit on the couch and read a book or like do my, my thing. But like, he wanted to be basically constantly supervised and spanked and spat on and humiliated. And, um, Mm -hmm. I had to like, I was like, well, I may as well fucking clean the house myself. This is like so much harder than cleaning, you know? And, and I wasn't (laughs) because it's just not my thing. So I think, you know, and the same goes with the fin dom stuff. Like it seemed to be pretty, it's like the golden goose to find someone who um who wants you to financially dominate them and I just like didn't have much luck and I feel like I wasn't coming at it from a very integral place either because it's just not my like it's not my kink I just wanted money <laughs> um yeah so but it's always just fascinated me that whole world yeah, it, it's a very enticing thing. And I think that from, you know, the limited exposure that we do have um, to that, uh, which is often fleeting, um, it definitely can appear and mostly does appear as the golden goose thing, right? Where it's like, mm. oh, free money. You don't have to do anything. You just tell them that they're, you know, a loser and give me all your money. And and then they give you your money and, and that's it, the end. And you know, that's really not the case. And so what I will say about financial domination is that um, it's difficult and it's rare. And if someone, especially in this day and age where it's actually quite a saturated market, um, that I I would say, I'm trying to think about how to like word this um, <laughs> in a mm-hmm. With a, without sounding like a complete cunt, basically. Um, I, I've i done a course on ethical financial domination. And mm. I, they're, they're, that's something that really drew me into it. Because when I, when I was looking at this, and, and I, before I didn't pursue it, I, I just got requests for it. Um, and I will say that it's really difficult to do in an ethical way um, for most people because with the uh the horny guys that come through there's very much a strike them while they're hot kind of mentality and sadly that often means that the ethics and the negotiations at the start mm. that should take place do not and right. so there th- there's a lot to it and you know not only is there that to consider but also you are usually having to manage their emotions. Sure, there are some that come through, which are they're called white whales in that whole world. Um, and the white whale will come in, just have a, a literal compulsion to dump their money onto someone. And then they will typically just disappear. Accounts will get deleted and they just, you know, I'm assuming usually feel shame. And, mm-hmm. and so it is a compulsion. And so, you know, with that power comes great responsibility. And sadly, that's not typically what I see in that world. And so it's a very, it's something that, you know, sure, like there's a, a great draw for, for women, especially because of that power imbalance, you know, of, of money mm-hmm. in this world. Mm-hmm. Um where, you know, we just want to take that fucking money and, you know, we're underpaid comparatively with men. And so, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of be like, nah, just fucking want the money and like, go away. That said, mm-hmm. like, you know, we, we, 
we really have to remember that there's a human on the other side of that and there is, you know, largely compulsion involved. And so with that has to come care. And so, you know, for anyone that is considering financial domination, I would just make sure that you approach it from an ethical standpoint because that is rare and it's um and it's really needed totally yeah that's really beautiful i'm glad you mentioned that cuz even with like um it wasn't like findom situations but i definitely had offers and people approaching me to do some doming work but like wanting to and i knew like i got to know them a little bit and i knew like they were like Uber driving for extra cash. They didn't have a lot of money to begin with, but they were wanting mm-hmm. to just like give it all away. And I was like, oh my God, I just don't feel good about this. I can't, I can't take that in good conscience. So it is um, yeah, yeah, it's important to like have other people's backs when they don't have their own because of the compulsion or, you know, the desire. Yes. So yeah, yeah, beautiful. Um, and I'm wondering, like, so with your particular arrangement with your live-in house slave um like does he have another life outside of that I mean he lives at your house it's a 24-hour thing like does he have a job how does he pay like is there findom involved there like how does that all work like practically day to day yeah great questions um yeah he he does have a job aside from his job I am pretty much his entire life. And so my slave, uh, his family have all passed away. So Mm -hmm. in terms of like connections to other loved ones, that's where, you know, when that's where that is that. So when I found him, he didn't really have any family and he's very introverted. So in terms of like community, you know, he was, you know, traveling around and kind of you know I guess flailing around a little bit but in a in a very mm. grounded way like he had his job and he's um, my housemates um, are always like he is so monastic like he just he has this obsession with China and he will just like watch Chinese documentaries in um, in what we call his hole because he actually lives in the basement in our laundry room and so um, he'll just go into his little hole and watch Chinese documentaries. And like, that is his jam. He loves that shit. And so, yeah, it's, um, you know, that that's our day-to-day life is that he will, he will go to work uh, Monday to Friday and he will serve like, like a complete devoted house bitch. And then I will dictate his self-care because that's another thing is that, you know, with, with the responsibilities of having a pet, uh, you have to take care of them too. And if I let him, he would just run himself into the ground Mm. in an effort to serve me. And, you know, essentially like what good is anyone when they're burnt out? So I also Mm. have to manage that. So yeah, that's kind of how it works. And so you said you've got housemates and I know you've got a husband, like how do they feel about it? Obviously you've got some really beautiful, open-minded legends that you live with. Um, But (laughs) yeah, I'm just trying to think like how it all kind of, how it rolls. Like, yeah. When is it, is it okay for him to come into the communal space? Like, is it only when he's serving or only when you order him to, and then the rest of the time he has to stay in his hole or like, you know, does he have to ask permission to leave the house other than at work and stuff like that? Sure. Great questions. Um, so I'm going to break that um, question up into two. So yeah, there was I have a couple a there. And then we have housemates. <laughs> um, so when I met my husband, as I said, I met these two people two weeks apart. And, you know, when I met my husband, it was really refreshing because um, I, I actually met my husband on a um, on a Facebook page for Burning Man, and I'd broken my strap on, and I needed to actually fix that, but didn't really want to go to a seamstress, and so I just looked up at the you know who was closest to me, and 
that was my husband. And so that's how I met my husband was, um, was well, he so he could fix your strap on for you. How did you know? <laughs> he had a sewing machine. I just, I just went oh, on, a, okay. on a Facebook page basically. And was like, I need a sewing machine uh, okay. and yeah. I need to, and this is what I need to fix. And so my husband thought I'd, um, like asked to fix a strap on like a top or something. And it wasn't until I got there and my husband was wearing this wonderful t-shirt that said the future is female. And, you know, he was, you know, we're, we're in California where weed is legal. And so he was like, yeah, sure. You can come around, but I just, I just got really high. So I hope you know how to operate this. And I was just like, Oh, great. Like I'll come get high with you and we can talk about pegging for an hour. And, and it was like, I rocked up and he was just like, oh right a strap on okay I've dated dominatrixes before and like I had a slave that was also my girlfriend and so like you're you're good and so we had this like really beautiful like afternoon where it was like we just weren't shocked at each other you know and I don't usually get that because I live a pretty out there lifestyle and so you know I it was just nice to be like, oh yeah, it's just your life. Like that's just what it is. Yeah, and that's cool. Yeah. And we don't need to make a big song and dance out of it. And so, um, yeah, like fast forward a couple of weeks and I was just like, you know, like I'm, you know, interviewing people to, you know, clean the dungeon and da da da. And, um, yeah, it was always just kind of like, it just flowed, you know, he's always mm. just been so chill about it. And, and my husband is very, very chill. So, and he also has the understanding. So, yeah, yeah. but my my housemates and I, and actually when I when I met my husband, um, I was living in a separate apartment, obviously. And um, not long after, it was like maybe I think five months or so after I'd met my slave, um, he moved he like my slave moved into our apartment but he was actually living in the closet at the time and this closet was like just big enough that he could fit like a like a single mattress in there and then it had some shelves for his very like small amount of belongings mm -hmm. and so that's where he lived he lived in our closet and um <laughs> yeah fast forward to like where we currently live like you know we my my housemates are friends and you know we didn't ever advertise a, a space to to rent it was just like you know it yeah. all just happened very organically and so they knew that I had a slave and I you know had, you know they they were aware of it and so when he actually came to move in to this place where I am now it was all just like well you know, this is my life and I do yeah. like to live. We all like to live unap unapologetically. And so it was definitely a moment of, well, this is how it's going to be. And, you know, you've, you've moved in here organically. So, you know, this is, this is the deal and, you know, totally. this is what you're signing up for. And, and, you know, there's definitely been moments where like early on, I didn't want to like totally fucking wig them out. And I had, um, I guess we kind of like broke them in easily, you might say. And we just kind of <laughs> yeah. like, you know, we, we didn't go too intense. And and as time has gone on and like we've just all been living together for a year now, it's it's hilarious. Like we, this morning, my housemate wanted to buy um, my slave a croissant and he we always joke because he says he eats slave gruel and his slave gruel is just like a bunch of vegetables that are roasted and that's it and um and we're all vegan so you know it, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm all for veggies but yeah it's very what he eats is very basic and so I had to kind of like you know coerce him with my housemate who is just like you know what we're gonna do is we're gonna like put this croissant on the floor because he wasn't he didn't want the croissant he feels like you know he just wants to be a slave and have his slave rule like we're just gonna put this croissant on the floor and we're gonna smash it into the floor and you're gonna fucking eat it okay and it we had to dress it up yeah essentially yeah, yeah, yeah. for him to actually go for it dress and it so down. now we have this whole 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, we have this like, you know, a whole thing going on now where like they get him and, and they understand that we have this like really strange dynamic and there's always weird shit going on in this house anyway. And so now it's just, you know, it's a wonderful, weird family that I have. Yeah. Fabulous. I love that. <laughs> And I love, like, you would just be such a beautiful, loving, ethical, considerate mistress to have. Like, I love that you're, like, forcing him to eat croissants so that he gets, like, oh, it was your housemate, but, you know, you were in cahoots trying to just, like, get him to treat himself every now and then and make sure he's doing self-care and things like that. So that's really, yeah, it's, it's heartening to think about. He's really lucky to have found you. I mean, you're lucky to have found each other. It seems like a match made in heaven. Um, Yeah. yeah yeah cool amazing I can't I just I want to come and like hang out at your house that sounds so fascinating I bet there'd be so much (laughs) kooky shit going on (laughs) there is and you are totally welcome to be here <laughs> oh, one day when international travel will be possible for me again. <laughs> uh, yes. So I'm going to slot in the segment Get Pregnant and Die. Don't have sex because you will get pregnant and die. die. Don't have sex in the missionary position. Don't have, don't have sex standing up. Just don't do it. Promise? Are you ready for this? as ready as I will ever be fabulous so pretty much it's you know your stock standard why with sex education shit how did it fail you what would you have preferred to have learned about I mean obviously you didn't get taught how to do golden showers but you were okay anyway still killing it on the aim (laughs) um but yeah do you have a story of how your sex education failed you basically Oh yeah, huge. Um, so I, I, you know, I had the, the, the same sex ed that most of us had, which obviously, as you just said, totally failed us. And I was very sexually active, very young. I lost my virginity when I was just turning 13. And so, wow. um, yeah. And I, I was like, really just like, I was like a dog on heat and I just wanted to fuck everything, basically. But I was, like, very underage. And this was, you know, it was tough to navigate. Oh. Um, that said, I, 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 you know, I made some very um, bad decisions along, along that way of navigating that path. And so I feel like what I really needed in that time, and this, this might have come from my parents, but it did not. Um, was guidance um, on how to express that um, that sexual desire in a healthy and safe way. And that mm. might have just been that I had a, a talk about exploring self-pleasure and mm-hmm. knowing yourself in that way before inviting others into that realm. And, mm. you know, maybe like the pros and cons of using, using a vibrator before like, you know, like getting, getting to know your hand skills before you jump onto a vibrator. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. Because what I found was that I became very addicted and, you know, I looked older than what I was. So I was able to go out and just buy a vibrator, but I, you know, I didn't really know what the fuck I was doing. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, I really wish that I had had that guidance of like, you know, well, sure, you're, you're like really, you're a horny teen, um, but you're not legal yet. And, you know, there's so much that you can do with yourself mm-hmm. before you actually go into experiencing that with others. And, Mm. you know, also like what would have been helpful was like, you know, thinking about like, um, you know, having an adult tell me like, you know, what to look out for in a sexual partner. And because, you know, there's a bunch of douchebags at that age and, you know, it's a really tricky thing to navigate. So, yeah, I think whether, whether that was, you know, I mean, I'm sure that would have been very difficult for a teacher to have that conversation and they probably would have lost their jobs had that have happened but like (laughs) I feel like parents like really need to um 
yeah, I, I really urge parents to like step up in that way because now what we're seeing is, you know, like 10 year olds have access to porn and, you know, mm. it's, it's a really terrifying world. And so we need to be having these conversations like when our kids are like, you know, around the age of 10, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So much earlier than you think, really. Um, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Amazing. Thank you. So I'm just going to launch straight back Welcome. into all of my juicy questions. Yeah. If that's okay. Hit me. <laughs> hit me. <laughs> um, so, what, like, with your relationship with your slave, is it? Because I think a lot of people, um, there's like some misconceptions and get confused about like whether it's like explicitly sexual or whether it's more of an erotic kink thing, but there's actually no sex that goes on. Da, da, da. Um, so I just want to like clear that up for people. Is it a sexual um, thing? Do you engage sexually with your slave? Um, yeah, that's my first question. Wow. <laughs> Great question. And yes, you're right. There's a lot of misconceptions. And again, I'll go back to, um, I feel like I'm bragging when I say this and, and I, I'm really not. Um, but my slave is just not the typical slave. Like most slaves that we encounter are very focused on getting their rocks off. And, mm. you know, it's like you said, like when you had someone come around to clean, like they just want to get beaten and, you know, all the things. And it's just like, who's serving who here? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, is, is this actual, am I serving you? Cause it feels that way. And so I'm really fortunate to have a, a slave that um, it's a lifestyle for him. As I said, mm -hmm. this is not just something that he does on a Thursday night when he has an hour and mm. he feels horny. And in fact, um, I've, I've never seen my slave naked ever. Um, mm -hmm. and nor will I ever want to. Um, I, it's an, again, it's a running joke that I'm just like, ew, like, I, I don't want to see you naked, like <laughs> gross. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, I'm always naked. I'm always running around the house naked. And, and you know, we all are here. And, yeah, um, yeah it, it's definitely not a sexual thing. And, and something really beautiful happened quite early on in our relationship. Um, it was a few months into COVID. And I'd given him a sock because his um, his main, like, desire is, is to, and fetish is, is, is to have socks and shoes and and anything to do with feet mm -hmm. that's his jam um mm -hmm. it's his toe jam and so he um I gave him a sock and I was like you know go go in the closet and do your thing and we had this conversation afterwards where he was just like um he it made him uncomfortable and I, at the time, like I said, it was earlier in our dynamic. And, and I, I guess I just made the assumption that he was masturbating with my socks. Mm -hmm. And he, um, we had this conversation and I made this off the, off the cuff um, comment, which I, you know, didn't think would stick. And I just said, I don't ever want you to masturbate ever again. And I, I, I was playing when I said this. and. Um, and he took it so seriously and it was so liberating for him. And he actually, like masturbation is something that, because I think he's so monastic, that masturbation kind of takes him out of that grounded headspace where he is mm -hmm. like so devoted and so we we do not have a sexual dynamic whatsoever. We've done some wild shit together. And, you know, he has featured in a bunch of my videos and stuff like that. And, you know, we, we've done all sorts, but none of it has been sexual. And he makes me feel so safe. And this was one mm. of the part of the conversation that we had when he was like, you know, telling me about how he really didn't want to masturbate ever again. And it was like such a relief for him, which 
you know, I messaged you just before um, when we were getting ready to come on this podcast. And, you know, I was like, I'm just masturbating and masturbating, as you know, is like, it's a, it's a huge part of, of, you know, our lives. We're, we're vaginal lovers. And um, so, and I, and I encourage that for men too. I want to say that I, I'm a huge lover of men. And so it, it's not anything to do with like, um, you know, a, a gender thing, but he is just so very monastic that sex or um, any kind of like, yeah, any kind of sexual activity for him makes him feel very uncomfortable and takes mm. him out of that very meditative grounded state, which he mm. literally resides in. Mm. And so, yeah. And to, to just like give some kind of um, idea of what his energy is like, because I realized that that kind of um, information might sound like he's being shut down and his energy everyone that I know that you know that I introduced to him is they're always like wow he's like a child he's like a little right. joyful boy and mm. so and he really is so when you think about like someone with that kind of energy who has you know this um, very devout world he's kind of like a celibate monk. Well, I was just going to say, he sounds like he would be the perfect monk. Like it's all about devotion and, you know, anything, anything yeah. like sexual energy or desire kind of like it distracts you from that main devotional practice or like that, you know, being grounded in that um, space. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it didn't sound to me like he was sacrificing anything. It just sounded like, oh, actually that gave him permission to just fully embody and live in that devotional space without the sort of distraction or the complication of sexual energy, you know? Exactly. Mm. And that's exactly on point. Yeah. You nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So interesting. So then what about your primary sexual relationship with your husband? Like, do you bring a lot of kink into your own sex life with him? Yes, we do. And so, um, in, in my world, um, there's, so I'm a switch and the switch mm -hmm. is someone that will be dominant and submissive. And I really love to submit to my husband. He's my dominant. And so we, yeah, we, we do explore a lot of things and we have an open marriage as well. So, um, yeah, our world is, um, pretty kinky and, you know, I, I like to explore like lots of different things. And, um, yeah, on the weekend, in fact, I was dressed as a baby, a very cute baby. And mm -hmm. I was pole dancing at a sex party at our house. And it was um, very, people felt very conflicted by it because apparently I was very cute and sexy, but I was dressed in a diaper and a little bib. I had a cum <laughs> bib on. And so... <laughs> Yeah, bib. it got some responses. Yeah, <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> okay, so because yeah. I was so, about yeah. to ask, like, do you go to kink parties and BDSM parties? Obviously, you're hosting them at your house as well. So, like, tell me about that. What are some of the things that I mean? You keep being like, "Oh, we've done some wild stuff," and I'm like, "Come on, give me more than that." Like, give us some <laughs> stories or some examples of this. You know? Oh man. Um, I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, I mean, we, yeah, we've, we've been to orgies that are just, I, I'll tell you like one of my favorite experiences because um, yeah. like with any, like with anything, when you are doing a lot of something, it's, it's hard to kind of pinpoint one thing. Um, but yeah. I'll, so I'll tell you one of my favorite experiences. Um, and this was, um, there's a beautiful community of people that I have in San Francisco and I attended um, an orgy there with about 40 people and we hired this like just fucking grand amazing mansion on Airbnb and they the organizers of this event had made it into a very ritualistic um, space where it was like we all had 
the same gowns and mm. we were all like you know wearing the same it was like it was like a temple kind of space but it was described to me when I um when I found this event as a um theatrical orgiastic revelry and wow. we we did um we had a circle of 69 and our beautiful MC um was strumming away Brian Adams in the center of a bunch of people who are all just like doing 69ers in a circle. Um, And that was probably one of my highlights was just like, like where the fuck am I? Like, oh my God, amazing. Um, yeah so wait are we talking yeah, like so 69 that... like like uh if what's that fucking movie um human caterpillar or no that's not human what centipede. it's called but <laughs> yeah human centipede is it like that kind of vibe or like pairs of people 69ing in a circle or like one-to-one like a massage train but 69ing yeah it was like a massage train but 69ing wow um wow yeah yeah, and we've done that same the same group of people. We've done um oh there was um one that I went to just in September. Um it was called um the Fuck Fest, Fuck Festival. And um it was the first festival that I've been to um since um you know COVID and uh there was the sex olympics and these guys started off the sex olympics with what they described as plug of war and it was a butt plug and there were the the butt plugs were tied together and then it was who could hold on to the butt plug for the longest while moving away from one another oh my god um, (laughs) (laughs) yeah so um i i yeah, and I just, you know, the, the most joy that I get is just, like, having, like, I like to get very creative with sex, and I, I, and I love being silly. I love it when those worlds come together, and it can be theatrical and ridiculous, and mm. so, yeah, there's been quite a few um, moments where I've looked around and just been, like, wow, like, this is my community, like, what the fuck? Yeah, like, what is my is life? Great. This is the best. <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly yeah so oh. those, those are some of the probably the, the the wonderful wild things and you know apart from that like you know I I just you know I'm bisexual and I just really love um sharing women with my husband and yeah I just yeah popping cherries and all the yummy shit wow Oh my god! I just fuck. We could do a whole episode on the fuck fest, um, sex Olympics. That just sounds. <laughs> so, oh my god! Wow. Because I'm, I love anything creative. Like, I'm not super um kinky personally, but I love inventing. Like, Lockie and I invent these like hilariously, just creative, like imaginary sexual scenarios or like combo moves we call them and like most of them are probably pretty much physically impossible or we would just like not do them because we're both pretty vanilla nil but we like we come up with like funny situations and names for them and stuff and like we've got a friend who is an amazing artist and sometimes we'll get him to do a drawing of it (laughs) um so I'm, I'm so with you on the like creativity and like playful silliness front like you know, I'm having yeah. like having a butt plug tug of war sounds like my worst nightmare, but it's also the fucking best concept. Like that's so funny. I, I wish I could be a um, uh, what like a oh my god, what is it? What is it called when there's like people like that a re- watch? referee? Or... Oh, oh, a yeah, spectator too. I guess yeah, just a spectator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, cool. it, it's fantastic. I love that creativity. Like that's one of the things that's probably most important to me in my sexual endeavors is like having someone that is willing to explore different things and get creative and, you yeah. know, and also with that, it really allows for like having conversation about, you know, oh, well, th- this doesn't work, but what about if we tried this? Like what happens if we, you know, a plus B equals what? Mm. Like what is on the other side? And I find totally. that really fascinating. And I love nerding out to that. 
Mm, yeah, totally, totally. And I mean, you guys are never gonna, never gonna get bored or let the spark die by the sounds of it. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, that's the plan. Mm. So I'm wondering, like, when you were younger and you were starting to dabble in this, um, did you kind of have to process or let go of or heal any shame around this sort of thing, like before you could embrace it as a lifestyle? Because obviously you have well and truly embraced it. Um, And, you know, giving golden showers when you were 14 probably shows that there wasn't a whole lot of of shame to get around. I don't know. But like, yeah, what was your process with that? Because obviously we can't really avoid a lot of the conditioning and the negative um, attitudes and beliefs around sexuality and all of that sort of taboo and stigma. What's been your journey with that? Yeah. um, I don't know how this happened. I don't know. um, I I just doesn't make sense to me either, but I didn't ever have shame around sexuality, even when my parents found out that I lost my virginity at 13. And, you know, like my mom said some really hurtful shit and I still did not feel shame. I just felt like, why is no one fucking listening? Like Mm. I'm, and and I have this thing that I go back to all the time. And and this is just like a universal thing that I, I just, I apply to everything. And that is if I'm experiencing this, I'm not the only one. And that Mm. has always helped me to, just get over like whatever it is. And so, and, and I, I don't know, like I just haven't had to try hard to, to get over any of that where it's like, you know, yeah. I, I knew from a very, very young age that I was an exhibitionist and, and, you know, very voyeuristic. And, um, I, I knew, um, when I was 13, I, I knew that I wanted to be a sex educator in some capacity and, that largely came from feeling like I'd been failed in my education and like, you know, and I was Mm. still like just 13. Um, but yeah, so I, and I knew that, um, as I progressed through life probably as like, um, maybe like early twenties or something, I knew that I wanted to be a dominatrix and I knew that I would at some stage and, I'm, you know, really thankful that, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've been around people that have been doing that and it's been um, accepted. It was just more of like a, well, how do I do that? So, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I've, I've never, I've never allowed shame to really take grip of me. Mm. And just because I realize that I'm a human and if, and if I'm a human and and experiencing these thoughts and desires and feelings, well, then there's others out there. And I think that that's one of the things that always has propelled me to ask for what I've wanted. And as I said, at the start of this podcast, like I found that when I ask for what I want, I usually get it. And it sure, it definitely can draw attention some unwanted attention and I've become very um quick at discerning like yeah that's not what I'm after like no Mm. and and just like knowing and 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 like I guess like yeah just feeling like you know knowing what's in alignment for me and what is not um but I believe that everyone should be able to express themselves in a safe way free from shame and judgment and mm. I really think that the world is exciting and that we get to choose and indulge in whatever we like. And that's really fucking cool. So let's just start asking for what we want and and also realizing that, you know, um, it can be hard to ask for what we want, especially as women, because we are socialized mm. to just be polite and kind of, you know, shut down and um, very ladylike. And it's not very ladylike to be like, I want to get fisted. But, you know, (laughs) that's a fucking reality. Like sometimes you want to just get fisted or, you know, (laughs) whatever the fuck it is. And so we should be able to ask for that. So, yeah, yeah, that's my take anyway. (laughs) Fuck yeah. Damn. Stay up on that soapbox. You got some good shit to say, girl. I um, I totally agree. (laughs) Like, uh, and it's so 
so amazing and rare and quite mystifying how you actually wound up just never really having any shame. I guess you were an old soul and you just like knew innately that like there is nothing to be ashamed about. Um, and, you know, you had a bit of a mission from the beginning to like set out and change the face of sex ed and like offer um, resources to people that you didn't have. Um but yeah, really cool and interesting to hear that like you just didn't have that um, that shame even when you were like reprimanded for losing a virginity or whatever else. Um, and, you know, that leads me to my next question is like what are your parents or your family, I mean, do they know about this? What do they think of it if they do? Or is it like a total double life that they don't know about in terms of like your pro-doming and having a house slave and stuff? Yeah, so that that is the one area of my life that is not integrated. And Mm -hmm. that's purely just because I don't think that my parents are ready to hear it at all. Like, um, you know, I've, I've, I've had conversations with them about my open marriage. And as soon as I start to talk about that, they're like, I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I I just know that they're not ready for that yet. Um, That Mm. said, I am someone who you know, I live in a different country to my parents as well. And I have done for like over 10 years. And I, since moving away from my hometown, I, and and also actually being there, that was one of the reasons that I moved away is because I'm really bad at lying and I don't feel like I should have to. Mm. And when someone's living in a small town and everyone knows everyone and it's very narrow minded, um, it's difficult to yeah. be wild because everyone's yeah. kind of judging you and you know people are getting upset with you so it was it was yeah. a good move for me to move away and um yeah I I know that um one day it will happen and they will um get to meet my slave but it's hard for them to understand my life especially from a distance and so um everyone that has met my slave and seen our dynamic is you know they always say like wow like you really have to be around you guys to actually understand that it's not even dark it's it's just so full of love it's weird Mm. and wacky but it's so full of love and there's far more sweetness and love than there is creepiness and so I feel like if I was to have a conversation with my parents and be like you know, hey, mom and dad on on Zoom or whatever. And um, I have this thing that I need to tell you, like it would just fucking crush them. And so I'm very much a fan of like framing things and like orchestrating things to happen in a way where they can be, you know, like, um, you know, we, we can have the best opportunity to present information and to to um, guide people into the places that they um, need to be and so mm, you know mm. eventually my parents will will know but but I'm at, the, at the moment especially with COVID um, it's more a thing of like you know they they would need to come out to see me and actually yeah get yeah. to see that whole dynamic before I then drop that bomb on them and blow their fucking mind yeah. maybe just a little <laughs> yeah totally yeah. oh it's so important to just be really tactful and sensitive about this because it's not you know yeah you shouldn't mm-hmm. have to hide a part of yourself and it would be ideal if you could integrate all aspects of your life and you know have them be part of it and accepting of that and whatever but you know, they're of a different generation. They're probably, like you said, not ready for it. They're not going to understand or even have the capacity to understand. And I think like, especially out of context, these things are just too far out for some people. And there's too many, um, I guess, misconceptions and assumptions about um, the BDSM lifestyle and elements of it that people just really don't understand or have their own judgments around. And especially boomers, I feel like, um, that aren't of that ilk would, yeah, would probably find it like so fucking shocking. Um, so I think, yeah, making sure to deliver it in a way where you can kind of control. Yeah. Over zoom is pretty out of control, pretty out of context. You know, it's just, that would probably be a disaster. So I totally think, yeah, you're going about it in a wise way. And it's like, sometimes it's not fair to drop that on people when they're just not ready and they're not able to handle that information or know what to do with it. It's like kind of 
cruel almost and it sucks that you have to like manage Mm -hmm. your parents feelings but like sometimes you just do have to manage other people's feelings and just be thoughtful about how you how much information you let them have and how you give that information to them and and then helping them understand it's almost like you've got to do aftercare for those conversations as well um yeah so and I and I wanted to talk a bit about aftercare because you talked you mentioned it earlier and yeah I'd love to because I think that's a beautiful and not like yeah there's misconceptions around this sort of thing and I think some people who don't understand it properly might not realize that there's actually a crazy amount of um ground rules and communication and agreements and like um negotiation beforehand and then there's also the aftercare and I think it's so much like when I understood that that just transformed the whole realm and I was like wow this is actually so beautiful and I feel like people who um delve into this world probably have fuckloads more like way better communication skills and like empathy and um ability to like I don't know if they're doing it properly you know I feel like they have a lot more skills in those areas um of relating than the average person in like say just like a stock standard monogamous relationship um because you have to like to do it in a safe and responsible way you have to have those skills and you have to take the time to do that so I'd love you to speak into that if you could yeah so um negotiations um as I said earlier like usually I would uh, have an application form like an extensive application form filled in so that I I know um uh, I have a, I have a bunch of information about them, and that will include like what their triggers are, what their hard limits are, like what their desires are, and you know all of those things that will help me form an idea of like how to guide that session. Um, mm-hmm. Also, things that they may be open to, um, and emphasis on the may because like you. Um, there's a lot of trust, you know, like someone is Mm. trusting you to take them on a journey. And when someone is in subspace, they are very fucking vulnerable. Mm. And so there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. And so, you know, you're essentially taking them on a journey and they're trusting you to do that. And navigating that can be incredibly beautiful. It's also incredibly hard at times because you're essentially having to mind read. And so, Mm. you know, you, you obviously, you know, are going to communicate throughout, but you know, when someone is Mm. like deep in subspace, like often, you know, they're kind of, they've checked out somewhat. And so, yeah, you have to really navigate that with like, um, with care. And then in terms of aftercare, I would always um, prior to the session like check in with them about aftercare like what kind of aftercare do they like what kind of aftercare do they need and you know some people um part of their um aftercare is just like wrapping up and disappearing very quickly Mm -hmm. and you know when 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 that is what they want um I think it's really important to check in with them later because sometimes mm. they're leaving in such a rush because that's a lot to fucking process. And as I said, yeah. you know, with the post conversion of especially males, uh, that is, you know, it's just very different to how vagina owners mm. actually um, present once they've come. So mm. there's that. Um, but, you know, hopefully, and, and what I really enjoy about aftercare is if I can be with someone and, and, and I always make the space for this, but making the space for that person to be held, whether that's just mm. emotionally or physically or both, and yeah. really just taking like some time to wind down without rushing that person out um, and making sure that, you know, they're, they've got a, a really um, gentle landing um, yeah, because you know beautiful. you're 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 leaving that headspace where it's like you know you went really fucking deep and mm. you know you might have tried like so many different things and also you know they might have been stretched or you know mm. like had like physical 
things happen where it's like mm. their body has taken some kind of impact or, yeah. you know, their body will feel different. So, mm. you know, I like to make space to care for that, for the, for the physical and, and just really like a gentle, like psychological landing uh, like afterwards for, for mm. that. And then also like checking in with them, like in the, in the maybe like three or so days afterwards, just to, you know, see how they've gone with their processing of that. And, you know, some people are just so matter of fact and will be like, yeah, I'm cool. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Especially males. Um, because, you know, we, you know, we're all aware that they aren't as skilled and encouraged in talking about their emotions. Um, but yeah, like making space for that at least. Mm, beautiful. I love that. It's so important. Um, so yeah, that's really nice to hear some examples of how you go about that and different ways depending on the sort of session that you've had and things. Um, amazing. Have you been hearing my rooster just going off his little fucking chops out there? I have not. <laughs> oh my God. Good. Okay, cool. I wasn't sure. It's like, so he's standing outside the fucking window, just having a massive crow off like a king dick. He's just learned how to crow, <laughs> a little shit. Um, and it's been like so loud. So I'm really glad that that's not coming through the mic. Anyway, there he goes. Um, <laughs> so I've got a few more questions before we finish, but are you ready for TMI? We love it. TMI, we love it. Oh yes, yes. I I took some time because I have I have so many, and I had to ask my husband like, is this really TMI? Because some of the stuff that I've done is really deeply TMI, and it, you know people wouldn't want to eat afterwards. But um, I think I found one that is um, hilarious and fitting. <laughs> oh fuck yeah! Oh my god, I'd I'd want to do a whole <laughs> episode of TMI with you. I just feel like you'd have so many epic stories. So maybe we'll uh we'll chat about that down the track. <laughs> Because you are like sure. a jackpot. But yeah, hit me. <laughs> so when I first started to go for pedicures with my slave and we would go, there was um, my both myself, my slave, and then the other um, dom that I would do sessions with. And he would take us both for pedicures. And we went to this little um salon and um you know before we'd gone we'd had this conversation where he was just really fucking awkward and he was like like goddess like do you think that um I could um maybe have um the the the, the nails from the salon and I was like, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't give a fuck. Like, whatever, like, take them. I don't care. Um, but he's so, in, like, he's just such a sweet little, like, little boy that, like, he, he was just, like, really embarrassed and, like, did not know how to, like, navigate that whole thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, yeah, he's, like, a 50-year-old man and just just turned into this, like, little infantile thing which <laughs> could not verbalize <laughs> so anyway I I took control like I usually do in that situation and we went to this salon and I just walked in there like a boss and sat down and I told these ladies that I wanted to collect all of the foot dust and the toenail clippings and stuff and they obviously looked at me like I was mad and I just said to them oh yeah, like I'm just collecting it for a Burning Man project. I'm going to make this like big, like huge cake. Um, and it's just going to be made out of body waste. Oh and my God. that was the end of the conversation. And then we would go into the salon like repeatedly. And they just, every time it was like, we just didn't speak about it. Unless they'd let, unless they they'd like, like forgotten a chunk or I could see a chunk of stuff and I was like oh no like there's some over there like you need to get that too, um, and so yeah that that's um and then he would just take them away and consume them. <laughs> oh, he'd eat them. <laughs> yeah, he likes to eat toenail clippings and foot dust and oh, anything wow. to do with feet. Toenail yeah. clippings. I feel like that would be. A 
so tricky to chew and get stuck in your throat. Yeah. But, I mean, he must have it figured out. Mm-hmm. Maybe blends it up in a smoothie. <laughs> No, he 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 likes them raw. He likes Just them on their them. own. Like, yeah, yeah. Wow. He's a strange creature. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing. Yeah. yeah, selling your foot dust is is a thing. <laughs> wow, wow. That's a goodie. That's a good one. Maybe for his birthday, you could make him a cake out of human waste products. Just foot I stuff. leave him these little envelopes of stuff, like of foot dust and, and toenail clippings, which I will say it takes me a long fucking time to get these little envelopes of, of stuff. Like you would be surprised how like little you accumulate over a year. It's ridiculous. And so I have to like really spread it out. And I make these little like these tiny little envelopes with like various pet names of his and I hide them around the house when I go on holiday and then oh. I'll incorporate them into his servitude so like when he's watering my air plants I'll like leave a little envelope like facing the glass bottom so that if he looks hard enough then he should be able to notice that there's a treat in there for him or I left one in the um, the cat shit scooper recently and I went away <laughs> for the weekend and I got back and he hadn't fucking done it. And I was like, well, well, you just don't get your treat then, do you? Because the whole fucking moral of the story is that you should be cleaning up that cat shit, shouldn't you? And now you miss out because you didn't. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, amazing. I can just imagine you like with your pumice stone catching it all on a bit of paper underneath <laughs> and hiding it around the house. This is amazing. <laughs> this is so amazing. I love this. <laughs> oh, so I want to know, like I've touched upon a few of the common misconceptions or things that people misunderstand about BDSM, but I'd love to know if there's any that you want to touch upon and talk about just to like clarify things for people. Like, are there any major, like quite common um, things that people assume or believe or don't understand that you'd like to explain? Yeah, there's a few there. I mean, I, I, there's my favorite one is the one that I mentioned earlier that BDSM is not just about beating someone up and telling them that I've been bad or that they're a shit cunt or whatever, but BDSM is actually 80% psychological. Mm. So it's a fascinating game of understanding what's going on between those lines. And so, you know, there's a, a whole world to discover about the psychology of it. And um, some of my favorite um, teachers in that world have been, uh, you know, PhD psychologist and it is it's just a fascinating like world to learn and I guess one of the other things that I um I think is a really common misconception is that you are um you're abusing that person and if you think about it like um if I want to be beaten like if I if I come from being beaten, then that's what I want. Like I, I, I'm wanting that, which sounds really ridiculous, but there's, there's a lot of people that, um, you know, just, just assume that it's abuse. And while it, it like physically looks the same, can look the same again, it's psychology. Like, and if someone is really getting off on that and you're giving them what they need, then you're actually caring for them, providing Mm. that you do it in a safe way, then that's like, you're caring very deeply for, for their desires and, you know, for for the things that they want to experience. So, yeah, Mm. I think those, those two things would be the, the, the main misconceptions that I, you know, um, often talk about to people and it's just so very misunderstood. Mm, Yeah, totally. And it's like, I think it's something I used to think about was like when I would get, um, I don't know, a client or, and I, and I really only skimmed the surface of this world. Like I said, it was not really my jam and I ended up just not really coping with it. I was like, but I don't want to spit on you and hit you and racially slur you. That makes me feel really uncomfortable and sad. So I was like, well, this Mm -hmm. isn't for me, but, um, 
you know, some of the things I got asked to do or people like wanted, I was just like, holy fuck, that is pretty hectic. But if it's not done by someone who like me actually has like compassion and empathy and understanding Mm -hmm. and like, you know, is, is ethical and like being kind of responsible about this, then it could fall into the hands of like someone who would be doing it for the wrong reasons. And like, I don't know, I was just like, I guess, worried about these people who are putting themselves in really vulnerable situations. Um, which is very trusting. And I was like, oh shit, there's probably people out out there that would be taking advantage of that. And yeah, I don't know. I used to kind of think, well, better me than someone who, but you know, there would also be better people than me who were actually like professionals (laughs) who actually really, really got into it. So in the end I was like, oh, look, it's not my, yeah, it's not my, um, my responsibility. They'll find someone perfect for them. And I am not that person and yeah, just have to have to trust that they wouldn't fall into the hands of someone really toxic and irresponsible. Um, cause like, yeah, I guess I had, this might be my own ignorance or like assumptions that are coming from, you know, my own, like some deep conditioning or judgment. So like really I want to like, you know, forgive me if I'm just putting my foot in it or like showing my ignorance, but Sometimes I did feel like um, like some of the clients I would meet had these kinks or desires because of some horrific childhood trauma. You know, like I just, just I was like, whoa, like that can't have just come about from nothing. And I, I also like heard, I can't remember where I read this, but I heard that men are way more likely to have fetishes or kinks. Um or even like things like pedophilia is like way more rampant in men because their sexual kind of preferences and identities solidify and cement at a really young age um, during puberty compared to females. And so whatever is going on then in their like teenage or childhood years um, gets kind of stuck in there and can result in like, you know, things like pedophilia, things like fetishes, um, and it kind of cements. And then that can turn into, yeah, certain kinks later on in life. Whereas it's like less common in women because our sexuality and like that part of our brain is more fluid throughout our lives. And I don't know if like there was a long time ago that I read this and I wish I could kind of reference the study or whatever, but do you know much about this? I'm not sure about that study. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, but what I will say, because, you know, that, that is something that comes up and, you know, in terms of like, um, is it stemming from trauma? Mm. And I would say that, um, you know, it definitely can, like, there's definitely people out there who are, um, feeding something that, you know, was generated via a traumatic experience and I think that there's also a misconception as well actually that I forgot to mention that BDSM is therapy and I really want to just um, clear that up because BDSM can be therapeutic it is not therapy though and mm. I think that one of the the best things that we can do for someone um, who is wanting a cathartic release with a fetish that may have been um, generated or, or, or linked to uh, trauma um, that's been formed earlier in life is having some good conversation beforehand. And especially, like I said, I really like to do taboo stuff. Mm-hmm. And so part of part of of wanting to like um be in that world is well you have to really do the groundwork and so yeah i i would say that it would be down to the individuals to talk about that and if it seems like someone is like um you know in in a a, a place that they're operating from um, from trauma and and usually that will show up by like erraticness or like you know um, like severe self-hatred that is like not um, it, it's clearly not play like it's not shifting like it's just consistent mm. 
mm. um, then then that would be some like red flags for me. Yeah, 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 totally. And what do you do in that situation? Do you not take on those clients um, or is there a way that you can navigate it or do you refer them to getting some therapy or? Yeah, yeah, I think therapy. Therapy is always something that I would recommend to to anyone if, you know, regardless of whether it's BDSM or not, like if I can see that someone needs help, um, I mm. would always direct them in that way. But, you know, we're especially um, in the world of BDSM where uh, people do have that common misconception. And, and when I say people, you know, often it is the the sub and the dom. Um, because you know, like there's a lot of dominatrixes out there who, um, you know, they're, they're not so ethical and, you know, they do just want to, um, brand what they're doing as therapy, but it's not, and it can be cathartic though. And there's nothing to say that, um, an experience that fulfills someone's desires, um, can't be healing and cathartic and also scratch that itch but it's very difficult to navigate because you don't want to be um, feeding any kind of um, any trauma or um, ideas about you know being stuck or broken and so on mm. um, so yeah I think it, it requires some like some conversation and you know I, I hope that people do have those conversations more. Yeah, totally. Amazing. Well, hopefully this episode starts a few conversations. Um, yes. And so just lastly, like I'd love to know um, if there's like a place, if, if you wanted to like s- suggest some, I'll pop, the, I'll pop the links in the show notes, but are there some good places to start if a person was wanting to explore this realm like it's often a bit daunting and like you know when I tried to dabble I didn't really have anyone to point me in the right direction so I was kind of just like yeah out there trying to google it and find find my way and yeah I think it would be a bit more um responsible and definitely a better way to go about it if people knew where to start like just to begin their journey with exploring this yeah, great question. And I can totally relate. Um, I spent a lot of time um, in my 20s. I'm now 32, but I spent a lot of time in my 20s just being like, I want to be a dominatrix. How do I do that? And like, you know, just people not really giving me any kind of resources, even though they were in the scene. And, you know, I will say mm-hmm. that I think there's a lot of um, protectiveness that happens over like not um, not giving resources to people that want to try that out because as I said it is a very saturated um Mm. uh, yeah place to be as a dom um that said uh there's two different kind of categories really um there's real life which obviously would happen at a dungeon and uh that usually when you're working at a dungeon they want you to sign up for a like an apprenticeship essentially Mm -hmm. um which takes a number of years and usually you have to start off as a submissive so that you actually know what it feels like to be a submissive Mm. that said not everyone is authentically a submissive and not everyone likes being beaten or you know so that kind of ethically can be um some something to consider and and you know obviously don't do anything that doesn't feel aligned for you um in the other world that I want to talk about which is the online world I have a bunch of resources um so Princess Kali is one of my favorite teachers and she has a bunch of different offerings and she's been doing this for a very long time. She's also the founder of Kink Academy, which is such a huge database of um, videos and um, articles about all different fetishes and kinks from like 
you know, flogging and whipping to like urethral sounding and all sorts of shit. You can find oh God, all What there. is that? What is urethral sounding? It's my new favorite thing that I haven't tried on myself yet, but I really want to. And it grosses my husband out and I'm hoping he'll get over that. Um, urethral sounding is where you insert, it has nothing to do with sound necessarily, although you can apply like a tuning fork or something. Um, but urethral sounding is the insertion of a metal, um, kind of like stick, if you will, like Mm -hmm. a, like a, um, my words are failing me right now. It's like, it's just like a metal medical instrument and you can put that Yes. Rod. Perfect. Yes. Um, a metal rod that you insert down the urethra and that can be done to a man or a woman. And so, yeah, it, it is, it gives a lot of people the heebie jeebies, um, because you know, urethra and stuff Mm. and putting shit down there and they come in different thicknesses too. So, but you, you can, you can vibrate them and you can do various different things and, um, I'm very interested in, in this at the moment, but I, I've, I've not done it. I haven't given it and I haven't received it, but I really want to receive that. It, I love medical play. Um, okay. so is it supposed to be pleasurable or it's more just like the sensation and the like, wow factor of like something going up your pee hole? I mean, it would be pleasurable for those people who like medical play and things inserted into strange places. Um, Mm -hmm. I also really like like having speculums inserted into me. And Mm -hmm. so if if you're into medical play, I think, you know, urethral sounding is something that will, you know, come up in conversation or, you know, like Mm -hmm. you'll you'll soon be made aware of urethral sounding if if you're dabbling in the medical play kind of world. Um, so yes, that is urethral sound, urethral sounding. Um, and, um, and, and also I would say that that's definitely not something you just want to go and like, um, you know, have at, you want to do that with a lot of care and you want to do it with someone who actually knows what the fuck they're doing. Um, because mm-hmm. I found out recently that with a woman's urethra that you only have like a, a very, very small amount of room. I, th- I think it was like two centimeters um, of, of room to kind of like, um, you know, play with before you're actually like at a, at a risky point in a woman's anatomy. Like lengthwise or width? Lengthwise. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good to know. You know, it, it, (laughs) it kind of, it, it goes, um, behind the, from what I understand, it goes behind the, um, clitoris, which is where the pleasure element of it is often for most. Mm. Um, but also it's very close to the bladder and you don't want to fuck with the bladder. So, you know, and women and UTIs and all that stuff. So yeah. Okay, (laughs) Um, cool. Carry on. (laughs) So back to resources. So that, that was, um, that was, that was kink Academy that have all these wonderful things. Um, and then the wicked Alliance as well is a fantastic group of women and they are, um, doing a lot of, uh, different workshops for online dominatrixes. Um, also Ms. Kim, that's M Z k-i-m um she does a lot of um stuff with night flirt which is basically like a um you know they have like uh calls and texts and you can sell your goodies and videos and stuff on there too so she does a lot Mm -hmm. of stuff in that realm and she's worked in that realm for quite some time um and then another favorite of mine is amberly rothfield and she is Oh, she has such a special place in my heart and I'm still doing coaching with her and, um, just, just an, a pure alchemist and, um, very, very knowledgeable. And yeah, yeah I love that, that person. She's very special. Cool. Yeah. So that would be my, my online resources. Fabulous. I'll put the links in the in the show notes for anyone who's interested. I did just think of a question I completely neglected to ask and that's about money. Like how much money are you mm-hmm. making and is your house slave paying you? Um, you know, is there like what's, you know, t- tell me a little bit about money, not to just be like, 
you know, everyone should get into doming because you make fuck loads of money. Cause I think that's another thing that like, that's where I was at. I was like, Oh my God, yeah. you get, you make like $500 for doing like, for just yelling at someone and kicking them in the balls. Like, this is awesome. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. I mean, that can definitely happen for sure. Um, when I was doing it in real life, I was charging 300, um, for an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe it's so a 300 mm-hmm. or 250. Um, but that was for two of us. There was two of us doing that. So, okay. um, you know, that's, um, a bit different. Um, and I was only doing double sessions in real life before the pandemic. So, mm-hmm. yeah, but if, if you go on like Eros, um, you can get a really good idea of what people are charging and mm-hmm. obviously the more experience someone has, um, you know, the, the higher their rates will be. Um, and in terms of online, like it really, really varies. Like usually via video, it's like per minute. Um, and one of my favorite things, and, and there's lots of different platforms too. So like sometimes you're um, like on um, Sext Panther, uh, you are getting paid to sext. And so, you know, that's, you know, you can set your rate up for, um, you know, how much per text I believe and um yeah and same with night flirt as well like you set your rate for your calls and stuff Mm -hmm. um and yeah as per my slave um I completely own my slave's finances he he has his allowance which I don't really intervene much with like I could if I wanted to be like really hands-on and be like you're you know you get this amount of money to spend on your groceries and that's it and he would make it work too because he's like you know such a minimalist um but I I don't like living in that way I want him to have you know you know the things that he needs yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I, I get all of the overflow. Um, and, you know, I'm also like the beneficiary in his life insurance and all of those things. So it's pretty deep. Um, mm. But yeah. Yeah. Mm. So there's, there's all that too. Amazing. Oh my God. I need to get myself a house slave. <laughs> Uh, no I've already tried that I'm just not cut out for it (laughs) yeah well I'm glad I'm glad you found like the yeah the golden goose like unicorn situation it sounds pretty idyllic (laughs) um and thank thank you you so much for being so open and really generous with your stories and your information and honesty um is there anything just one last question is there anything that you want to like tell people you know say they're feeling like abnormal or like they're broken or they're alone because you were saying like luckily for you you didn't feel alone um in this like your main kind of thing that you always came back to was like well if I'm experiencing this and feeling this and desiring this then there must be other people also experiencing this but I feel like you know through my work I do hear a lot of um, people say like, oh, I just, I know it's weird. And I know like, I'm probably the only one and people feel quite alone and as though they're wrong or they're weird or they're abnormal. So is there any, any like reassurances or anything you'd like to just like put out there to tell people, um, you know, just to reassure them, like, it's okay. You are totally normal. That's, you know, you're not alone in this. Yeah. I will go back to my statement from before and just remind people like, and, and, you know, use this as a mantra as well. Like if you are experiencing something, whether that's a thought or, you know, a a time in your life where things feel tricky and, you know, complex, you're not going to be the only person that has ever experienced that. And therefore you're not alone. And I would say, you know, in conjunction with that, that I believe that we are all here to find a place of belonging. And ultimately that I, I think that that is what we're all searching for is a place to belong or, you know, people to belong with. And one of the things that absolutely changed my life with my feelings of where I belong as a complete weirdo was 
actually getting involved with the burner community and that it, mm. it's not just a festival in fact it's not a festival at all it's it's a temporary community that sets up but also that community exists all year round and it is so fucking enriching and liberating to be a part of and there are regional burns all over the world so if mm. this is something that you've never heard of before i recommend that people look at burning man and regional burns and get involved and it's you know a beautiful liberating um community and lifestyle to be a part of and that everyone mm. that i've spoken to who is a part of that community has always you know approached it because they were looking for more from life or they were looking yeah. for their place to be and that is something that people find there and i just can't i can't encourage people to go enough it really does mm. change your life and there is yeah. something for everyone there and it feels like family that's the thing there is something for everyone like no matter how out there or strange you think it might be there is someone for everyone and there is some place for everyone and I find like I haven't been to Burning Man in the States but I've been to like the equivalents the regional ones in Australia there's Blazing Swan in WA there's Burning Seed in New South Wales and yeah even if you can't go to the physical festivals there's the online burner communities and I do really feel like, yeah, if you're seeking belonging, if you're seeking like acceptance and a place to be radically self-expressive and um, find community that are going to be non-judgmental and like supportive and encouraging, that is a fabulous place to start. So that's a really good suggestion. Thank you, Miss Kay. Um, Thank I've you. had the best fucking time. This has been awesome. I'd love to get you back on in the future. I'm sure this episode will spark a lot of questions and interest from um, my audience. And yeah, thank you so much. I will mention really quickly before I stop pressing record that I now have Labia Lounge merchandise on my website. I've got like a fanny <gasps> pack. I've got um, tote bags and like whatever, but I, there's like some funny things. There's like a one piece bathing suit. There's like male jocks. Um, I mean, the fanny pack is definitely my favorite, um, but yeah, there's Labia Lounge <laughs> merch head to my head to my website to grab some of that if you like um and miss Kay, thank you so 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 much it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for having me i'm so glad that this exists and thank you for <laughs> doing this i'm so grateful oh no nah, it's totally it's my honor and my privilege you've been you've been one of my favorite guests so far this has been a blast i'll speak to you soon Aww. <laughs> love you bye bye and that's it, darling hearts. Thank you for stopping by the Labia Lounge. Your bum groove in the couch will be right where you left it, just waiting for you to sink back in for some more double L action next time. And in the meantime, if you'd be a dear and subscribe, share this episode, or leave a review on iTunes, then you can pat yourself on the snatch because that, my dear, is a downright act of sex-positive feminist activism. And you'd be supporting my vision to educate, empower, demystify, and destigmatize with this here podcast. Also, I'm always open to feedback, topic ideas that you'd love to hear covered, or guest suggestions. So feel free to get in touch via my website at freyograph.com or say hey over on Insta. My handle is Freya underscore graph underscore YMT and I seriously hope you're following me on there because <laughs> damn, we have fun. We have fun. Anyway, later labial legends. I'll see you next time.